Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. And we have a lot of people in the parking lot. If everybody was actually together in one spot, you'd be like, wow, we got a good crowd this morning. We do. We do have a good crowd. So let your heart be enlightened by that. This morning, because it's the end of the month, we are looking at a song. The song that we're looking at is a very difficult song to sing. It's Jesus Loves Me. If you want to look along at part, it's number 274A in your songbook. You won't be singing out of your songbook this morning, not that song. Uh, But that's where it's at if you'd like to look at it. The song was written in 1860 as a poem. It actually was a poem that was in a novel. The novel was written by Anna Bartlett Warner's sister. And Anna wrote this poem because there was a child dying in the book. So she wrote the poem, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong... They are weak, but He is strong. And she wrote two other verses as well. The idea of the song was not to make it a song. It did not have a chorus. We'll talk about that in a minute. It was just three stanzas as a poem to comfort a child. That idea of comforting children is what we will look at mostly this morning. Two years later, William Bradbury, who wrote a lot of the hymn, the the music that's in your songbook, or at least a, a good portion of it, he wrote a chorus. He changed a couple of the lyrics, a couple of the verses in it, he, and he added the chorus, and that was done two years afterward, and it was it was made into a hymn. Over a hundred years later, in 1971, David McGuire changed another one of those verses but left the chorus alone he published that in the anglican hymnal and uh, that third verse is what we will sing this morning uh, because that's the one that i got for the powerpoint and they didn't offer any other choices so um the verses themselves the first one we know the first one is always the same the second one that anna wrote is Jesus loves me, loves me still, though I'm very weak and ill from his shining throne on high, comes to watch me where I lie. In your songbook, that's verse number three. Verse number two we'll talk about comes from uh, Bradbury. The third verse she wrote says, Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. Then his little child will take up to heaven for his dear sake. Comfort for a dying child. Bradbury wrote a second verse that we're familiar with. uh, Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. His third verse stated, Jesus loves me, this I know, as he loved so long ago, taking children on his knees, saying, let them come to me. The third verse, and I should have put this in order, Got to wait for it to catch up. Jesus, take this heart of mine, make it pure and holy thine. Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. So the most modern verse actually in the most archaic language. But this is Jesus loves me. A tune that I'm sure we are all very familiar with. The idea of Jesus being a comfort has to be established though, right? Why is Jesus a comfort? Because he looks good in pictures on the wall. Because the poem Footprints in the Sand makes me feel good. Because Mama said that Jesus is going to take care of me. And I mean, I don't know anything about Jesus, but Mama said so. Those are all reasons. And none of them as powerful. None of them as pure as the truth. John starts his gospel by establishing what Jesus is, who Jesus is. In John chapter 1, you can go to John, we'll be there for a little while. 
In John chapter 1, in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We'll establish in a minute that Jesus is this Word that offers the light. Because that's what John does. But we're going to skip forward just a little bit. Look in the next chapter. Right at the end of the next chapter. It discusses how Jesus knows exactly what you need. He knows where you are. He knows not where you are specifically on this earth. Because he has the best GPS tracking. He knows where you are in life. What you've got going on. Who your friends are. Your influences. The things that matter to you. He knows the things that excite you. And the things that hurt your feelings. Or that get in your way. Or that that make you more down. It says that as he preached. Or as he spoke to the people that he interacted with. He knew how they felt about him. Jesus knows how you feel. He knows who you are. He came not because He wanted to condemn the world, but in John chapter 3, in the next chapter, as you look over, you look at the whole point of the Word coming and offering light was not to show that darkness is, but to show more appropriately that the light of life is available. He came to save. So we go back to where we started in John chapter 1. Life was the light of men. This is what is brought by Him. He is offering life. He is offering to show you the way to take out of darkness or the idea that you don't know where you are or you don't know where you are at or the idea truly and more deeply that your future is dark without Him. That without the saving power of God, your future is a dark, uh, has a dark outcome that is going to happen. Death and darkness do not win. Life wins. Life always wins. If you had your choice to live or just go ahead and die right now, which one do you choose? See, life always wins. Anybody choose death? Life always wins. Life is the better, the, the best outcome. And that's what's offered and available because of His love for us. This is given to all as the first chapter continues. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through Him, yet the world did not know Him. And so as we try to be children of God, we do not attempt to, or we should not attempt to, replace the light. We don't change the Word of God, but rather we should attempt to reflect it. Truly, sometimes we are better reflectors than at other times. And so we come here to remind ourselves to polish our lives, to remove whatever does not look like God, to wipe it away, as best we can so that we can reflect that light that He gives. We can show you by our life, not that we can save you, but that the power of God can save you. That the life of Christ will save you because Jesus loves you. He cleanses from sin sickness and offers To make people children of God. In verse 12 of that first chapter. To all who did receive Him. Who believed in His name. He gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of the blood. Nor of the flesh. Nor of the will. But born of God. He'll go on in chapter 3. To establish that being born again. Being born a, a second time. And we'll talk about that toward the end of the message this morning. To be cleansed from sin is is the attempt that we are trying to make to drive the darkness out of our lives, to live lives in the light, to reflect light so that others could see it, so that it could be desired 
by then. So in 1 John, not the epistle of John, but in 1 John, it's closer to the end of your Bible. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful to, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we say we haven't sinned we make him a liar and his word is not within us see the truth is as you may look around and you see other people in this room and you say they say that they're a christian but i know that they sin in this way yeah and if they said that they didn't sin then they're incorrect about that and if you think that just coming to church makes you pure you're just incorrect about that because we all sin and if we try to say that we haven't we're just being silly at best we're just being silly at worst we are putting ourselves forward as something that we're not <coughs> we can attempt as best we can to be sinless and we should The goal in the next chapter, as John continues to write, my little children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin. By the way, I wrote the bulletin article for next week already. It is, do not sin. It is based off of this kind of thought. You don't have to keep on sinning. It's in the Bible that all have sinned and fallen short, not that all continue to sin. You don't have to keep sinning. You can fight harder. You can struggle more against your temptations. You must repent or your salvation isn't salvation. And so that you can come up here and you can try to be the best Christian that you can be, but part of that is resisting the temptation to sin. Not to always look back and say, well, I'll go ahead and sin because I know that I have a propitiation for my sins, that being the Christ, our Christ. Sin is not desired, but it does happen. And so that if you do sin, you're not without hope. You have a propitiation. It's a word we use all the time, right? Nobody uses this word all the time. It's an older word, but it is so appropriate. Propitiation means... Or propitiation is an action. It is the act of making something favorably inclined to appease or to conciliate. The act of making something, and in this case, the actions of Christ dying on the cross, offering salvation to you through coming in contact with His blood, the actions of you submitting to, or because of your belief in Him doing something, namely, as Romans 6 would point out, being baptized into His blood, making contact with His blood by the power of God, propitiation. Making us favorably inclined. To make us favorably inclined. Go to chapter 4 of 1 John. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. But this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. He sent His Son to be that thing that makes you acceptable to God. That thing that cleanses you to God. That thing that makes you favorably inclined to God. If you haven't come in contact with God, as it says here, this is almost a direct repetition of John 3.16, right? This is the reason that Jesus came so that we could be saved. How is that done? By making us favorably inclined from God so that He would be appeased or conciliated after our sins. To make favorably inclined the sinner. Not necessarily the saved. Although yes, the saved. Is it not comforting to know that this is Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me to this point. So that I can be comforted in my sickness even though I'm not of the, the, the novel that was where this poem was intention, originally intended. Even though I'm not part of that novel. 
I am part of the great story of God that He sent His Son to save me. To save you. But as an individual, not as a group or as a collective, He sent His Son to save me. Insert your name here. God is favorably inclined toward me because of the blood of His Son. He went through agony and death for me. Jesus loves me. I'm going to have to ask for an amen on that one. Jesus loves me. But He shouldn't. Because I know who I am. I know the person that I am. I know the sins that I have committed. At least most of them. And He shouldn't love me. Thanks for not saying amen there. But if you put yourself in that same honest position, you know the sins that you have committed. You know the things of your heart that you've never told even to your spouse or to your children or to your parents. You know the things inside of you that say, this doesn't line up with God, but I can't not feel this anger, this lust, this, this desire, this, uh, this whatever it is. If we are honest with ourselves, Jesus should not love us. That's why Romans chapter 5 is written, or at least a portion of why Romans chapter 5 is written. So go ahead and turn there in your Bible, if you would. Romans chapter 5. And we're going to go backwards through this because I've already established that He does love us and that He shouldn't. He shouldn't, but He does. In Romans 5, verse 10, while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more than that, now we are reconciled, or much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Reconciliation is the act of conciliation or to bring two parties back together. That is one of the definitions of propitiation. To conciliate. To reconcile. I know they're different words, but they have the different definitions that are so close together that they are strong synonyms. While we were still enemies, Christ loved us. Jesus loves me even though I'm a bad person because He wants me to be saved and then He wants me to rejoice in being saved by Him. Why? Because He didn't waste His time. He didn't waste His effort. He didn't waste His blood, sweat, and tears. He didn't waste the mortal life that He was given because He died for someone who will live for Him, who will be with Him in eternity while we were enemies, while we still hate Him. He still loved us. Back up a couple of verses. God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. The wrath of God is stored up and that while people still choose to hate God, there is a, a terrible day coming. That's your invitation song. There's a great day coming. Well, in one of those verses, that's the last one, there's a sad day coming. When the sinner shall hear his doom, depart I know ye not. There is doom stored up, but there is patience on the behalf of God to say, I know there are some sinners who need to be saved. I'm not saying that. God said that. I know there are some sinners who need to be saved. Will you be saved? Will you turn from your unrighteous actions and live righteously? Not because your righteousness saves you, but because the power of the blood of Christ, as we have already sang this morning, does the saving, does the washing. So back up a couple of more verses. Oh, I hit the backwards button. Verse 6 of chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. 
For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I want to ask a question for for you to answer inside yourself right now. Do you believe that Christ died to save anybody? You or someone else? I hope you answer yes. Inside yourself, did Christ die to save anybody? That's called faith. See, that answer yes inside of you is called faith because you believe that Jesus died to save. And what I offer for you this morning is that that weakness that is spoken of in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 and in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, while we were still weak, while our faith was nothing, Jesus died for you because Jesus loves you. He died for me, personally. Me, but not only me, for you. At the beginning of the book of John, I think this says 1 John. It's not 1 John, it's the Gospel of John. In John chapter 1, we'll read verses 14, 16, and 18. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, He comes and He dwells among us. It is speaking of Jesus. Verse 16, For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. Christ has made known how you can go past the wrath of God. How you can not have to deal with the wrath of God. He has made it known and He lived it. He lived to be a sacrifice for us. But not just that He was the sacrifice. John keeps calling Him the Word. That power to save is found in your Bible. It is the words that were saved for us so that we could live Christ, not just be saved by Him. We receive strength from salvation and life through the Word. We receive the grace of Christ to know God. Grace upon grace. As it says here, God is for us. He is not sitting in the back wanting that any should perish. That's chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, right? And so His Son was sent to be our salvation. In Psalm chapter 40, David cries, starting in verse 11. And you can thank Mark. That's where I stole this from. As for you, O Lord... You will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. I will give you this morning that David is talking about the lesson that we have had so far, that we have heard. My evils are ever around me. My iniquities have overtaken me so much so that I am in a darkness for which the only cure is the light of the life of His Son. Jesus loves me. This I know. Because the Bible tells me so. The Bible is His Word. And He is the Word. Jesus loves me because He told me so. Making contact. We stopped in Romans chapter 5 where we talked about being enemies of Christ. And at that moment, He died to save us while we did not deserve it. We're told in chapter 6 that we should make contact with 
His death, burial, and resurrection by being baptized just like He went down was completely covered and then came up to still live that we're supposed to do the same thing. I'd love to go over that with you if that is your purpose this morning. Jesus loves you. And that while you're a still sinner, while you're still a sinner, and that if you are not saved, you'll walk out of those doors still a sinner. The wrath of God still stored up and waiting for a great day to come. You don't have to be. You can let the light shine into your heart. I'd love to talk to you about that. Not that I'm perfect, but that I want to reflect what His Word says. And if you need to fix your life by the light of His Word, let's talk about that. And the appropriate time would be as we stand and sing, but you can contact us at any time. If there's anything you need to fix, please make it known as we stand.